And the good thing is that the, um, we've, we've just started to talk about uh, some of the impact of different types of uh, attacks uh, on our companies, on our infrastructure. What I'm going to talk about is the content protection side of this equation. Um, so first, I'll tell you a little bit about who Friend MTS are. You may be aware of us, you may not be. We're a British company, we've been around for about 20 years, and we are focused on a particular aspect of content protection and anti-piracy. Uh, in that we focus exclusively on, on video um, value chain piracy in the live domain, so particularly working with sports rights holders and uh, broadcasters to protect premium content, both live and on-demand uh, entertainment. Our key aspect of the way we work is to identify the source of piracy, verify that it's what we're looking for, and then remove it, take it down as soon as possible. There's a variety of ways in which we can achieve that. And I'll go through some of those um, in a moment. So coming up, we're going to look at a case study. Now, as, as we've already spoken about, uh, a lot of the challenges we face talking about this subject is actually anchoring the debate with an actual live example, naming names. And that's very difficult to do for a variety of reasons. And today's no exception. So what I've done is I've actually created a case study that is based on actual work we're doing today. We're doing for a variety of customers across the ecosystem, but I've bl deliberately blended it together, but it's based on uh, real experience. So this is essentially a true story. So our use case focuses around a broadcaster, an entertainment platform called Friendly TV. And they happen to be a telco as well as a bro broadcaster. They have multiple service operations, so they span pay television, linear, free to air. They have OTT services that are delivered via apps and via web browsers. They commission their own content. They license content in from other suppliers. And it creates a very dynamic environment with which to uh, deliver content to their legitimate audience, but also a very, very rich attack surface for pirates to consume that content and take that content as well. We adopt the principle that pirates always choose the path of least resistance, the cheapest, easiest way to capture that content, and preferably one that's already delivering at a very large scale. They have to do the least amount of effort. So what, what I've done is I've put together a, a checklist, a scorecard, if you like, of the activity that Friendly TV undertake, some of the treatments that it applies to the risks that it's already identified, and on the other side of the equation, what a pirate will do to get access to that content. So let's look at the distribution path to start with. So as I've already explained, we have linear, we have OTT, and they also syndicate some of their content to other third parties who are licensed for that content as well. So delivery medium, you'll be very familiar with all of these uh, via satellite, cable, IP. Uh, a lot of their devices have a HDMI port on them to connect to uh, display devices. Uh, they also deliver via a variety of apps in the different ecosystems, both HTML5 for smart TVs, but iOS, Android, all the usual suspects, Roku, etc. And then that third party syndication, again, typically done via satellite fiber over IP. So there are some technical protection measures that are implemented, which is standard industry practice for these types of distribution paths. So conditional access is typically used for linear broadcast for pay TV. Uh, HDCP as a content protection protocol for HDMI is implemented. And then on the OTT side, digital rights management or DRM, and then CDNs are deployed to distribute that content securely to the end user, the subscriber. There are also additional uh, security measures to deliver into the web environment, which is inherently less secure than other forms. And then on the third party side, there's um, specific ways of, of uh, delivering that content using some of the same technology, but also being able to restrict and limit down to specific devices that are allowed to receive that, um, that content. Okay, so uh, so uh, IR desk, internet receiving device, so a uh, professional level satellite receiver, uh, MAC address, the physical network address of the device, are different ways of being able to restrict access to that content. So on the other side of the equation, our scorecard, what are the likely uh, means of attack, uh, 
that pirates are going to, to uh, employ in order to get access to that content. So we ask Scott, the first question is, is that, so is that particular distribution path act attackable? Yes, it is. And how is it done? In, it typically with conditional access, the ability to intercept that, so secure control messages, exploit vulnerabilities inherent in those platforms, or indeed being able to share cards in older systems. Some of the preventative technology that can be deployed is ability to actually mark that content down to a subscriber level. And I'll talk a bit more detail about that in a moment that lets you identify the, in, the specific instance that's being abused in this scenario. The next item, HDMI, we may be very familiar with HDMI as a, as a uh, connectivity uh, standard. However, the uh, HTCP protocol, which was employed in order to try and prevent that content being copied, is of no barrier anymore. It's been compromised very, very uh, quickly. And in fact, a $20 HDMI splitter um, has that done very quickly, immediately, in order to, to deliver its service. So again, another one of the technologies that we can employ to um, uh, com combat that is, is some of the subscriber level identification process, the trace to source, and I'll come on to that in a moment. OTT side, this is where a lot of the, the um, attacks change posture quite dynamically. Uh, we were talking just before we began the session today that there was a certain irony that when we were in uh, HDCAM SR physical tape world, there was a certain degree of protection that was afforded. If you didn't have access to a device costing tens of thousands of pounds, you actually couldn't access that content easily. So you restricted the vectors of attack quite substantially. We move into the digital domain, all bets are off. As if you can play back that content on a consumer-based device or you can man manipulate it with software, it's very, very easy. Um, to attack. And of course, we build in the best practice that we can. We employ digital rights management. We employ uh, security uh, um, at the CDN level. But insofar as our budgets allow, our architectural designs allow, and there are compromises that are brought in that cause that, that problem. And in particular, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, we see problems around stealing encryption keys, abuse around CDN leaching, which is a particular problem, uh, and also credential sharing. So we've heard a lot about people just sharing access to different subscription services. So there's a variety of um, mitigations that we can employ in order to, uh, to target and address those particular problems. And I'll explain how they're layered up in a moment. The web browser is a particularly important distribution path for a lot of um, platforms because it requires the least amount of user technology in order to deliver the service. And so it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a, um, a holy grail in terms of a distribution path for a platform, but it's also one of the most complex and difficult to secure by its very nature. So uh, pirates, if they can find a, a, a browser player that's been compromised and has a vulnerability in it, then they'll exploit those as well. And a combination of different layered um, solutions to provide uh, mitigations against these attacks allow Friendly TV to ultimately control access to content at its border. So it knows when content is being accessed in an unauthorized fashion, and it has the ability and the tools to do something about it, which is really important when you're addressing an, uh, a, uh, an attack that's happening at the time. Uh, and it can happen across any distribution path at any time for any types of content. And that final element around third party syndication, the same uh, considerations uh, need to be uh, thought about. There is also the additional factor, of course, of friendly TV has no visibility on what happens on the other side of that interface. It has commercial and contractual relationships with those parties, but it doesn't actually have purview over the technology itself. So another um, technique around being able to identify the specific distribution path is also very useful to focus your efforts when you're mitigating an attack. I'm going to talk a about CDN leaching now, which is a particular uh, problem that's being more and more widely um, seen. I mentioned before that there are common patterns of architectural design when you're building a streaming platform, an OTT uh, platform 
you make similar choices or similar choices tend to be made around how you deliver entitlement, what the user experience is, which digital rights management technologies you use, how you distribute and deliver the content. Pirates are there to exploit that. The screenshot on the right hand side there, the green box at the top, is taken from a, uh, a forum where they're discussing ways of being able to inject a key into a URL to form uh, a, a query into that CDN that lets you say, give me that piece of content that's encrypted, give me that piece of content with this key, and this key I've obtained from somewhere else completely, and I pass the two pieces of information together, and the CDN has no concept of whether that transaction is entitled to have that content. It has simply been presented with a valid encryption key. So the only logic that CDN has is if you're presented with a valid uh, key, serve the content. The other challenge we find is that content is often encrypted with a single key and is not rotated. So that key exists for years. We have uh, several examples of, glo of a global OTT platform that hasn't rotated any of its encryption keys in over two years. So one key gets you access to everything. And if you've then delivered an ABR ladder with rich 4K HDR content at the top end of the spectrum and a mobile targeted stream at the bottom, it's one key for everything. So rather than having a different key for different stages in the ladder, you simply find the key, find the content you want, and the CDN will serve the pristine highest resolution it can. And the pirate will always take that because it's a great sales tactic. On the left-hand side here, also just a couple of examples of uh, if you're familiar with BIS keys for satellite uh, delivery, um, there are many sources of uh, BIS keys that, even though they are rotated, you can find those keys, uh, access the, the signal overhead, and decrypt that content, particularly prevalent with um, event cinema, where that content's distributed via satellite, very, very limited encryption standards that's delivered to different cinema locations around the world. So, just a couple examples of some of the real challenges of how uh, pirates are looking to exploit design vulnerabilities within some of these platforms. So this is what I call the Wheel of Fortune. So this is our content protection program. So I'm not going to go through every single item, but essentially what we're illustrating here is a program that must detect uh, breaches, it must detect content abuse, it must analyze it to make sure that it's relevant to us, that it's something that we want to do something about. And then it must be able to, in some way, disable, disrupt, or enforce um, the platform's rights and intellectual property. So we're going to a little bit more detail. And I think this aligns really nicely with some of the, the other kind of comments that have been made today already, that it really needs to be a program that's endorsed from the very top of the organization. It's built into the DNA the culture of the organization. Everybody has a part to play in keeping the content secure, ensuring that consumers, fans, the audience have the correct access to that content and enjoy it without compromise. An established incident response. So lots of different vectors we've gone through. I know I've rattled through lots of different um, methods of attack. Each one has a slightly different response. It requires you to do something different. But if you can then begin to involve various different aspects of your organization to play a key part in that, you can then begin to be, be more effective at how that response is handled. And also measuring how these programs operate. What does success actually mean? Are you shutting content access down from unauthorized sources? Are you converting those audiences to legitimate audiences on your platform? Are you meeting some other obligation that your rights holder has set upon you? And also, I think today is a really good illustration of actually coming together to understand some of the challenges that we face. Our adversaries are very well organized. And as I've already demonstrated, they share a lot of information. They are unencumbered by any aspect of the law at all. And so if they can share a win, they will. We need to be much better at doing that ourselves to become effective. There are common problems, there are common adversaries, particularly in content protection that we are facing. 
and we're able to deal with it when we are able to share that intelligence. Let's just look at the, the uh, yellow and green, uh, sorry, orange and green segments of our enforcement program. I'm just going to give you a little illustration here of, of how that looks in, a, in more of a schematic form. So Friendly TV acquires its content. It might buy that in. It might commission its own content, live and on-demand material. There's a uh, content processing step where it is um, packaging up and making it ready for distribution. And then in the middle there, there's the uh, channels that it uses to distribute its content to its own audiences and its own subscribers. And this is where the bad guys come in. If we were doing Panto, we'd all boo and hiss at this point. This is Fiendly TV. You see what I've done there? You see that? It's very clever. Um, so this is uh, the pirate operator who's come in and they have found a vulnerability that allows them to access that content. They may well be using the CDN leeching trick which means that Friendly TV has to pick up the bill to serve all of that content to the pirate's audience. Or they're also created their own pirate infrastructure that lets them restream or rebroadcast that content, take one feed, and then make it available to tens of thousands of people very, very easily. And there's the illicit viewing of content that we hear so much about. We hear about the financial damage, the, the uh, societal damage, and also the damage to our industry as well as uh, consumers' interaction engagement with that content. So what do we do about it? Well, this is a large-scale problem. And so we've developed a technique that works very much like the human fingerprint. We mathematically fingerprint the content that we receive from our clients. And this is what we refer to as a reference. And then we are looking online in lots of different locations to find unauthorized copies of that content, both for device piracy and what we call open web piracy. So piratepeat.com, Facebook, YouTube, social platforms, and so on. We identify uh, a piece of content of interest through the metadata that we harvest. And then that prompts us to go and fetch a sample of the video itself, and we make another fingerprint, which we call a candidate, and then we match the two mathematical values together, and that gives us a high confidence that it is the content that we're interested in, and that allows us to automatically move to the next stage of enforcement or disruption activity that we undertake. And this happens at a large scale, so you know, on, a, on an average day, we'll process 15 months of video every 24 hours to illustrate not only the inbound reference content, but also all of those candidate uh, examples of piracy that we're tracking. So that monitoring activity allows us to then um, e execute some enforcement um, action to try and get that content removed. And your mileage varies at this point for what we call compliant targets, such as uh, uh, social media, you know, um, YouTube, Facebook, really good examples they kind of will comply. You give them a, a, some content uh, and a notification and they will take that content down. They actually have on-platform tools that you, we, we use as well that allow you to proactively um, uh, try and prevent content being published on those platforms. It also builds up a, a data set of, of business intelligence so we can identify patterns of behavior, not only with the pirates themselves, but also how that content's being illicitly consumed on what devices, and also how they are organizing their piracy infrastructure. And I'll come on to why that's really important in a moment. The other aspect of, of a global content program is how can you effectively remove that content quickly, particularly for live content, live sports content. If you are not effective within minutes, pointless. If it's a pay-per-view boxing match, it could be over in four minutes. If it's a football match, if you're not effective before half time, forget it, there's no point. It's really important that when uh, a new drama or a theatrical release, that first opening weekend, that exclusivity that is, that is licensed to a particular party is maintained. And trying to reduce the, the propagation of unauthorized copies of that is critical in that window. So think of the activity here in that time window. So source revocation, here's the same diagram again that we spoke about. Fiendly TV doing what they're doing to get that content to their customers. 
and we introduce another technology here called forensic watermarking. And that adds an invisible marker to all of the outbound content that Friendly TV is distributing. That content mark can sometimes be applied at the server side, or, or our recommended approach is actually to put it into the client because it lets you uh, orchestrate um, a, a particularly robust method of, of uh, watermark embedding in, into that process. That means all of that content that Friendly T Fiendly TV are now illegally consuming has a mark. And the important part of it is the mark is unique to the individual subscriber or device that Friendly TV are using in their legitimate ecosystem. As we're identifying content from pirate sources, not only are we doing a fingerprint match, we're also doing a watermark extraction. So again, millions of extractions a month give you that body of knowledge that lets you determine how pirates try to evade or collude to remove that content, but it gives you a very strong confidence level that that watermark uh, relates to that particular uh, instance. So that information is passed back to Friendly TV and for all you GDPR aficionados, the payload is not identifiable to the individual. That is the preserve of Friendly TV that holds that uh, personally identifiable information. But it actually lets you add any payload you want to, to that um, identifier. And that causes another action which is the revocation of entitlement and the enforcement action that can be undertaken. So that allows Friendly TV to identify the specific device that Fiendly TV are misusing or subscriber subscription on a, 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 a web service. And they can terminate that access immediately. And the cadence at which you do that varies by content type. So if it's live sports, you want to remove that revocation immediately. If it's a, a, diff, uh, uh, a different type of content, perhaps of a different commercial value, you might say, well, let's chalk it up on the account. If we see it again within a time period, two strikes, and then we'll get rid of it. Different um, business rules and, and policies can be employed depending on what the type of content it is. You might also be um, uh, mounting more of an investigation, so you're collecting data and evidence at this point rather than um, acting upon any enforcement action. Well, that's a really interesting idea. One of the things that we're looking at at the moment is with the advent of dynamic ad insertion, right? It's just all you're doing is triggering a insertion of something in a piece of content. We've already identified the precise session and stream in the case of, say, a CDN, the precise stream that CDN is emitting that is being abused by Fiendly TV. So you could absolutely orchestrate a call to action instead of terminate the stream. I want to talk very briefly about one other aspect, which is quite um, a relatively new um, uh, enforcement action that um, we've pioneered here in the UK and Ireland. Uh, and that's the concept of being able to block access to content using a court order or what's, what's called a section 97A um, uh, uh, blocking order uh, from the Copyright Design and Patents Act. And that actually allows you to uh, compel an ISP to block content from their subscribers. So traditional enforcement techniques that we've spoken about have varying degrees of effectiveness, as I said. To try and scale a manual equivalent of that is just not possible. And it can be sometimes difficult to tune anti-piracy programs for specific events where they run at different times. Static blocks, that's where you go to court and say, please block piratepeat.com, are really ineffective because piratepeat moves to piratepeat2.com and we're off and we have to start all over again. So there are some dynamic elements that are added into some of those orders now, but really what we're trying to do here is a network level approach that actually says, it doesn't really matter what domain that content is hosted at. What we're interested in are the delivery servers that Fiendly TV are using that I illustrated before. Identify that, map out all the network infrastructure, and then pass that 
that information to the ISP who will then block access to that content. And it's updated every few minutes during, during an event time and then outside specific events, it's stood down. Uh, it's really important that there are no overblocking occurs. You don't want to be blocking um, Facebook.com, for example, even though they may be hosting or there may be content that's unauthorized to be there. So here's that schematic diagram again. Uh, Feedly TV in operation, it's taking its content. The key difference here is, as you, you, may, I'm sure you may be aware, but when you're accessing the internet, say you're a BT subscriber, when you're accessing the internet, you're not on the internet at all, you're on BT's network. And there's a great big gateway routers that sit in between that and a bunch of other technology, which my colleague will talk about, I'm sure. And there's uh, the ability to identify the pirate infrastructure that's hosted elsewhere and then pass that information to the ISP. It meets certain criteria and then access to that content is, is then uh, prevented from being uh, accessed by the subscribers. And that has uh, a very disruptive impact on uh, Fiendly TV's service. They're selling their service as a paid for subscription to a pirate operator. If you can't get access to it, they get complaints. People move elsewhere. They just, they continue trying to disrupt their activity. And again, this provides additional business intelligence and enforcement activity based on the success of seeing Fiendly TV disappear or you're monitoring their customer support channels to see where their customers are complaining and actually whether they're using shared infrastructure. That's a really useful aspect when you can identify, actually, it wasn't just Fiendly TV that was affected, but uh, a dozen or, or, or more other services that are using the same underlying pirate infrastructure. And it's part of that multi-layered content protection strategy that I spoke about before, about being able to apply everything from a legal takedown notice, which not particularly effective, but one needs to do to, to um, express the rights that you have, right through to these more um, dynamic disruptive activities that really affect the delivery of that content. Also chasing payment providers, getting uh, disruptive activity so that a user of a pirate service cannot use a credit card, for example. They have to use crypto. That's actually a really good thing in, in the sense that consumers are less comfortable with that as a payment method. And what we find is that actually it reduces, able to reduce um, the uh, effective um, damage caused by piracy. And this again is just an example where before the uh, capability was deployed, where we combined watermarking with, uh, with blocking, we're able to see there's a shift from the platform that's protected, in this case is the OTT column, through to after the uh, technique has been implemented, you can see a reduction. And actually what's happened here, you'll see that the final um, column in the bar chart there has increased. And what that actually illustrates is, that's an MPVD, which is a third party licensee. So pirates have gone to source somewhere else from that content. So you see that shift, that value, that effectiveness. And, and that allows you to, to sort of chase piracy away from easy to use um, hosting infrastructure. And also longer term, you can see that the efficacy where content reduces year on year. And, and I think we're, when we get into this type of content protection and efficacy, a single percentage point can be a significant improvement. It can represent a significant financial value, but also um, a, um, audience engagement value um, uh, on a year on year basis. And we tend to look at pirates in the actual consumers of pirated content in, a, in different ways. It's not true to say that everybody always knows what they're doing is illegal. I would argue that it certainly was like that, but as more pirate services become more sophisticated and look more like legitimate offerings <laughs> and are often uh, purchased uh, on Fire Sticks, for example, or other streaming devices that are pre-configured and are sold in a variety of marketplaces, you buy these things, you plug them in the back of the TV, it's got the same interface that, ever, that it would normally come with. It is actually challenging for a consumer to determine that. 
and you're paying a subscription fee to a pirate as well. So again, gone is that barrier that, well, it's free, so of course it's not right. That's no longer the case. So what we find is we find there's different types of um, pirate user, if you will. There are those that are legally inclined, so they are, if they knew that it was an unauthorized or an illegal service, they would pivot and they would buy legitimate subscription. You get those that are opportunistic, they're looking for something, they can't immediately find it, they use the pirate, the, the pirate source instead. And then, like lots of um, uh, commerce, there are those piracy inclined. So I think the retail equivalent is shrinkage. There are people who will steal from your shop, and they always will. Um, but it being able to define and dif distinguish between those types of users is quite important to know how to determine how you target, how do you communicate, how do you engage with those users. And that's quite separate from going after the criminal infrastructure, the large scale operators of, of piracy. So the final thing is, I think just really just to summarize that pirates are always gonna choose that path of least resistance. That's the key message. When you think they won't, they won't choose that. That's too easy. That's usually the method they're going to use. If the entire chain is not protected, none of it is. They only need one means of access. And then, and then it's, it's, it's done. If you look at a well-implemented security system to give you visibility on the different means of attack, you will get attacked, that's undoubted. But what you can then do is do something about it, but in a more precise way than not having that visibility. And also looking at the unexpected, uh, the unexpected events, particularly if you've got a piece of high profile content that you see as particularly valuable, maybe it's from a long running franchise or it's a sporting event that's got a, had a lot of publicity. It's important to have a posture that's relevant for that event and involves multiple people in the production process that are delivering on the day for that content. And finally, enforcement does work if you choose the tools carefully. Thank you.